The first casualty when war comes is truth. Senator Hiram Johnson, 1917. In wartime, the state seeks to destroy its own culture. It is only when this destruction has been completed that the state can begin to exterminate the culture of its opponents. In times of conflict, authentic culture is subversive. As the cause championed by state comes to define national identity, as the myth of war entices a nation to glory and sacrifice, those who question the value of the cause and the veracity of the myths are branded internal enemies. Art takes on a whole new significance in wartime. War and the nationalist myth that fuels it are the purveyors of low culture, folklore, quasi-historical dramas, kitsch, sentimental doggerel, in theater and film that portray the glory of soldiers in past wars or current wars dying nobly for the homeland. This is why so little of what moves us during wartime has any currency once war is over. The songs, books, poems, and films that arouse us in war are awkward and embarrassing when the conflict ends, useful only to summon up the nostalgia of war's comradeship. States at war silence their own authentic and humane culture. When this destruction is well advanced, they find the lack of critical and moral restraint useful in the campaign to exterminate their cult the culture of their opponents. By destroying authentic culture, that which allows us to question and examine ourselves in our society, the state erodes the moral fabric. It is replaced with a warped version of reality. The enemy is dehumanized. The universe starkly divided between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. The cause is celebrated, often in overt religious forms, as a manifestation of divine and historical will. All is dedicated to promoting and glorifying the myth, the nation, the cause. The works of writers in Serbia, such as Danilo Kiss and Milovan um, Digilas were mostly unavailable during the war. It remains hard even now to find their books. In Croatia, the biting satires of Miroslav uh, Kraleza, who wrote one of the most searing portraits of, of Balkan despots, were forgotten. Writers and artists were inconvenient. They wrote about social undercurrents that were ignored by a new crop of self-appointed nationalists, historians, political scientists, and economists. National symbols, flags, patriotic songs, sentimental dedications invade and take over cultural space. Art becomes infected with the platitudes of patriotism. More important, the use of a nation's cultural resources to back up the war effort is essential to mask the contradictions and lies that mount over time in the drive to sustain war. Cultural or national symbols that do not support the crusade, are often ruthlessly removed. In Bosnia, the ethnic warlords worked hard to wipe out all the records of cohabitation between ethnic groups. The symbols of the old communist regime, one whose slogan was brotherhood and unity, were defaced or torn down. The monuments to partisan fighters who died fighting the Germans in World War II the lists of names clearly showing a mix of ethnic groups were blown up in Croatia. The works of Ivo Andrik, who wrote some of the most lyrical passages about a multi-ethnic Bosnia, were edited by the Bosnian Serbs and selectively quoted to support ethnic cleansing. All groups looked at themselves as victims, the Croats, the Muslims, and the Serbs. They ignored the excesses of their own and highlighted the excesses of the other in gross distortions that fuel the war. The cultivation of victimhood is essential fodder for any conflict. It is studiously crafted by the state. All cultural life is directed to broadcast the injustices carried out against us. Cultural life soon becomes little more than the drivel of agitprop. The message that the nation is good, the cause just, and the war noble is pounded into the heads of citizens in everything from late-night talk shows to morning news programs to films and popular novels. The nation is th soon thrown into a trance 
from which it did not awake until the conflict ends. In parts of the world where the conflict remains unresolved, this trance can last for generations. I walked one morning a few years ago down the deserted asphalt track that slices through the center of the world's last divided capital, Nicosia on the island of Cyprus. At one spot on the asphalt dividing line was a small painted triangle. For 15 minutes each hour, Turkish troops who control the northern part of the island were allowed to move from their border posts and stand inside the white triangular lines. The arrangement was part of a deal laboriously negotiated by the United Nations to give Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots access to several disputed areas along the 110-mile border that separates the north from the south. The triangle was a potent reminder that once the folly of war is over, folly itself is often all that remains. War, just as it tears down old monuments and demands new ones. These new monuments glorified the state's uniform and unwavering call for self-sacrifice and ultimately self-annihilation. Those who find meaning in the particular, who embrace affirmation not through the collective of the nation but through the love of another individual regardless of ethnic or national identity, are dangerous to the emotional and physical domination demanded by the state. Only one message is acceptable. A soldier who is able to see the humanity of the enemy makes a troubled and ineffective killer. To achieve corporate action, self-awareness, and especially self-criticism must be obliterated. We must be transformed into agents of divinely inspired will, as defined by the state, just as those we fight must be transformed into the personification of in unmitigated evil. There is little room for individuality in war. The effectiveness of the myths peddled in war is powerful. We often come to doubt our own perceptions. We hide these doubts like troubled believers, sure that no one else feels them. We feel guilty. The myths that determine not only how we should speak, but how we should think. The doubts we carry, the scenes we see, that do not conform to the myth are hazy, difficult to express, unsettling, and as the atrocities mount, as civil liberties are stripped away, something with the war on terror already happening to hundreds of thousands of immigrants in the United States, we struggle uncomfortably with the jargon and the cliches. We have trouble expressing our discomfort because the collective shout has made it hard for us to give words to our thoughts. This self-doubt is aided by the monstrosity of war. We gape and wonder at the collapsing towers of the World Trade Center. They crumble before us, and yet we cannot quite comprehend it. What really did we see? In wartime, an attack on a village where women and children are killed, an attack that does not conform to the myth peddled by our side, is hard to fantom and articulate. We live in wartime with a permanent discomfort, for in wartime we see things so grotesque and fantastic that they seem beyond human comprehension. War tur turns human reality into a bizarre carnival that does not seem part of our experience. It knocks us off balance. On a chilly, rainy day in March 1998, I was in a small Alba Albanian village in Kosovo, 25 miles west of the provincial capital of Pristina. I was waiting with a few thousand Kosovar Albanian mourners for a red Mercedes truck to rumble down the dirt road and unload a cargo of 14 bodies. A group of distraught women, seated on wooden planks, set up concrete blocks was in the dirt yard. When the truck pulled into the yard, I climbed into the back. Before each corpse, wrapped in a blood-stained blankets and rugs, was lifted out for washing and burial, I checked to see if the body was mutilated. I pulled back the cloth to uncover the faces. The gouged-out eyes, the shattered skulls, the gaping rows of broken teeth, and the sinewy strands of flayed flesh greeted me. When I could not see clearly in the fading light, I flecked on my mag light. I jotted each disfigurement in my notebook. 
The bodies were passed silently out of the truck. They were laid on crude wooden coffin lids placed on the floor of the shed. The corpses were wound in white shrouds by a Muslim cleric in a red turban. The shed was lit by a lone kerosene lamp. It threw out a ghastly, uneven, yellowish light. In the hasty effort to confer some dignity on the dead, family members, often weeping, tried to wash away the bloodstains from the faces. Most could not do it and had to be helped away. It was not an uncommon event for me. I have seen many such dead. Several weeks later it would be worse. I would be in a warehouse with 51 bodies, including children, even infants, women, and the elderly from the town of Prescaz. I had spent time with many of them. I stared into their lifeless faces. I was again in the twilight zone of war. I could not wholly believe what I saw in front of me. This sense that we cannot trust what we see in wartime spreads throughout the society. The lies about the past, the eradication of cultural and historical and religious monuments that have been part of the landscape for centuries, all serve to shift the ground under which we stand. We lose our grip. Whole worlds vanish or change in ways we cannot fully comprehend. A catastrophic terrorist strike will have the same effect. In Bosnia, the Serbs, desperately trying to deny the Muslim character of Bosnia, dynamited or plowed over libraries, museums, universities, historical monuments and cemeteries, most of, most of all mosques. The Serbs, like the Croats, also got rid of monuments built to honor their own Serb or Croat heroes during the communist era. These monuments champion another narrative, a narrative of unity among ethnic groups that ran contrary to the notion of ancient hatreds. The partisan monuments that honored Serbs and Croats Croats fighters against the Nazis honored in the new narrative the wrong Serbs and Croats. For this they had to be erased. This physical eradication, coupled with intolerance towards any artistic endeavor that does not champion the myth, formed a new identity. The Serbs, standing in flattened mud fields, were able to deny that there were ever churches or mosques on the spot because they had been removed. The town of Zvornik in Selb held Bosnia once had a dozen mosques. The 1991 census listed 60% of its residents as Muslim Slavs. By the end of the war, the town was 100% Serb. Branko Gryak, the Serb-appointed mayor, informed us there were never any mosques in Zvornik. No doubt he did not believe it. He knew that there had been mosques in Zvornik, but his children and grandchildren would come to be taught the lie. Serb leaders would turn it into accepted historical fact. There are no shortage of villages in Russia or Germany or Poland where all memory of the Jewish community is gone because the physical culture has been destroyed. And when mixed with the strange nightmarish quality of war, it is hard to be completely sure of your own memory.